So we have two very illustrious speakers today. It's, this is a really kind of exciting one. We have uh, Nick Brian Kins and Sheila Modrian, um, who are going to be our, our speakers for the session. So um, I'll introduce Sheila now, and then we'll have half an hour, including questions with Sheila. And then Simon will introduce Nick Brian Kins for the second half. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really amazing to have Sheila here. It's a researcher that I've been citing through my entire academic career, but have never um, spent much time with in person. Um, Sheila is a really um, uh, heavyweight in the field of, of tangible and tactile interaction. She's done a huge amount of research there, which I, looking at the names in the room, I'm sure is fairly familiar to many of you. Um, and has done really useful work for me personally on the evaluation of digital musical instruments. That, that paper uh, in Computer Music Journal from 2011 was really formative for me in thinking about the evaluation of instruments very widely in terms of different stakeholders and, and a really kind of usefully zoomed out perspective on that. Um, so a, a real kind of heavyweight in the field of HCI and music um, and thinking about tangible and tactile interfaces beyond. So very happy to have Sheila here. I'll, I'll pass over to you at that point, Sheila. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Is that okay? Um, yes, so this talk is really, um, first of all, thank you um, to both Simon and um, well, to both of you for inviting me. Oops, sorry, I, I'm getting people joining me in my ear here, so <laughs> that's why I'm slightly distracted. But I'll, um, so yes, this talk is really a more of a thought experiment than a fully formed research program. And I'm going to acknowledge that I'm borrowing heavily from both uh, Paul Durish's title, Where the Action Is, and sort of looking again at the role of action in interaction design, which is something that's been very central to a lot of my work. Um, and so uh, borrowing from that, and also, not, although not explicitly, um, from you know action sound and all that work in that area. And what I'm trying to propose here is to revisit some of the work of Cado, uh, Claude Cadot on the instrumental gesture in the light of augmented and extended reality. So basically what I want to try and do here is revisit the action sound relationship. Uh, first of all, in terms of musical instruments and then trying to broaden that out. And then thinking about action, sound and physical manipulation, as again, we broaden away from musical instrument design, which is some very specific and informative things, I think that can um, help us rethink tangible interaction in an interesting way. So then sort of extending the DMI model to XOR um, and to see where that gets us. And finally, then just some concluding thoughts. So this is a picture that Bill Verplank drew for me um, when I, was working on my thesis on um, haptics and interaction design. And it just sort of shows this link between the musician and an instrument. And it shows the, the two channels of feedback, although there's one energetic channel of input, the two channels of feedback, one being haptic and the other being audio. And this sort of, uh, that, that image kind of encapsulates Claude Cadeau's idea of the instrumental gesture showing how you know it convey the their system conveys energy from the player to the instrument which he termed ergotic function and then also encomp encompasses the tactile perception of the environment of the instrument player coupling which is um what kodo called the sort of epistemic function because there's knowing that can happen in response to what what one feels in that loop um, so, and the final then is the uh, the semiotic function where information is conveyed to the audience um, by means of the, them watching the action sound coupling that, as it unfolds during performance. And in this talk, I'm really going to focus on the first two of these, which are the gothic and the epistemic functions. So here's a sort of a schematic, if you like, of the first image. In this one, um, just really shows what the what form of the energetic exchange between the player and the instrument takes. 
And you can see here more explicitly sort of arrows showing how energy, energy goes across this mechanical coupling between the player and the instrument. Some of it um, comes back. So this is what happens in reality. Some energy gets converted into sound, and but more energy gets converted um, into and reflected back to the player across the coupling between the player and the instrument. And of course, some gets lost just through, through sort of entropy. And the reflection back to the player can be in the form of both a force and a motion. So it can either be like a spring-like energy pushing back on the player, say from the key of a flute or something, or it can be motion as in, you know, a key of a piano pushing or being raised up underneath the finger um, as a sort of, as the weight of the hammer comes back down and pushes the other end of the key. But the point to take away here is that the instruments, human interaction, these interactions are mechanically coupled and they're also ergonomically complex and they're temporarily nuanced. So those three things are really important. And as musicians, this is something that we, we don't even think about. It's just so intuitive for us that all of the expressive nuance in a performance has to come through the mechanical coupling between the player and the instrument. And that, that coupling or the unfolding of that energy exchange over time is what gives us the expressive output that shapes the notes that we play. And as we know from the field of DMI design, in the case of a digital musical instrument, this coupling is sort of technically still there because you're still pushing on something and somehow sound is coming out in response to what you're pushing on. But the coupling is not direct. It's no longer a mechanical coupling. It's a mapped coupling. So you still have a, a sort of ergodic function in that energy is traveling from the player to the instrument and there's sound coming back. But the lack of this mechanical coupling means that um, now this, this energetic exchange is one that's mapped. It's not actually present in the mechanical, uh, in the, the coupling between the player and the instrument. And there may be touch feedback present, but it's likely to be generic. So, you know, the classic case we think of is a keyboard where you can switch between a piano and an organ or a harpsichord. Um, and you do get some mechanical feedback from the, the, the keyboard surface itself, but the sound no longer reflects the particular way in which energy was um, added or you know, brought into the instrument through the coupling between the player and the instrument. In terms of the epistemic function, there's certainly some tactile feedback there, as I mentioned, but it's kind of generic. So it doesn't really reflect the specific nature of the way that sound is produced by whatever instrument you're controlling. So as we know from an organ, you know, you want to keep your finger down all the time on an organ because as soon as you lift your finger, the sound stops. In the case of a piano, it's more like a ballistic system. So when you hit the key, a hammer is set flying and, and there's nothing you can do to shape the note once that hammer has left the key. Um, so they're very different. And in this instance where we're looking at sort of, you know, synthesizer keyboards, the key feels the same and it behaves the same, but it doesn't, you're not getting any sense of the energy exchange that's creating the sound as you would with the real uh, instrument. So for, in terms of the epistemic function, there's not much you can learn from the feedback from the instrument because it doesn't really reflect the mechanics of how the sound is being produced. So if we try then to extend this notion of the instrumental gesture, here the instrument being more broadly construed as an instrumented object, if we try and construe that, that to the case of extended reality or TUI, we'll find that there's more often a focus in extended reality on the form of an object, but there's very little thought about the energetic exchange that happens when somebody actually picks up something like a tangible object um, and manipulates it. Certainly that action is sensed and all of, the, um, all of the temporal nuances are there in the data that's sensed if the object is instrumented or being tracked. But a lot of that information is kind of thrown away, which is a shame because it could be, there's a lot of um, nuance in that those, those 
actions and in those gestures that we could actually use to do something more interesting um, as we map those gestures into the digital environment. So here's a, a case in point is the reactable, which most people are familiar with, I'm sure. Here, um, there is actually an action sound mapping and the reactable more than any other TUI tries to do some temporally nuanced um, mapping between gesture and feedback. But still the link is somewhat arbitrary because the objects that you manipulate, while they may have affordances like being shaped like knobs so they're easier to turn, or being shaped like sliders so they're easier to do sort of linear mappings. There's still these objects that are mapped through um, a digital sort of layer onto the underlying digital representation, which could be an instrument or it could be something like an environment like uh, Max MSP or something. So, you know, as we see in most TUIs, the manipulation of a physical object controls the state of an underlying digital representation. That's kind of like the classic interpretation of a TUI. And often the affordances of the manipulated objects, as I mentioned, like in the case of a rotary knob, are mapped to parameters of the underlying digital representation. So here we can sort of see how the energy exchange between the, um, the TUI and the system actually happens. On the one side, you have a tangible object and on the other side, you have a digital representation, but you still have to map the gesture space of one onto the parametric space of the other. And um, the output is typically mapped to the input rather than the other way around. So you, you have a data set, you kind of know its parameter space, and then you try to look for the gestures that make more sense to, to map. That's not always the case, but it's uh, typically how, how mapping is done for TUIs. And so looking back to the Kados model, you can say that energy is exerted on the T tangible object by the user. So there is an ergodic channel going in one direction, but there's no actual return of that energy. So in most cases, the TUI objects are not active. So you don't get anything back. It's it's usually either through sound or, or a visual representation that you get the results of what you did uh, fed back to you. But there is the idea that the form of an object can, can usefully constrain the gesture space. So if you give somebody an object that's a particular shape or has particular sort of size attributes or even you know texture or whatever, that may constrain the gesture space and kind of guide people to using particular actions in a, in a kind of useful way. Now there are as a whole other class of uh, tangible objects that fall into this category of shape changing interfaces. And these are interfaces that either shape or change their shape in response to something the user does. So you can kind of squish them and they'll stay squished or they, they might bounce back a little bit, or they could be active in which case they have some kind of internal um, actuation method that allows them to become longer or fatter or, or whatever. There's some attributes that you can't change, but some of these things can be changed in response to um, how the user is uh, moving their hands or whatever. And so in the case of the active um, TUI, you do get this nicely um, complete ergodic exchange. So yeah, there's a gestural input, so energy is put into the system. And then you can map a reflection of that um, energy input into some kind of shape change at the output. That's um, so that you can actually, again, it's mapped, but you can sort of start designing some kind of ergotic response that's not necessarily mechanically coupled, but could be, you know, could have some meaning. So it can start taking on some epistemic function for you um, if you, you know, can manage that mapping in a useful way. So here's Materiable. This is a, a project from Hiroshi Ishii's group at MIT. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can kind of follow through to see how they conceptually used the, the framing of an active uh, object in this case. So output is still mapped to input in this case. Um, the, in, the shape, the object may be deformable or it may be, just be reactive. So 
one side you have then this idea of it's tangible but it's also deformable and then on the other side of this arrow you still have a digital um, representation that's what you're ultimately manipulating and in the same way as you have in a dmi um, the uh, energy is not directly coupled but it's sort of mapped in a in a useful way So then just to formalize this again, the active shape, shape changing interface can push back on the user. So you did get some restoration of an ergotic kind of mapped ergotic function. Both active and passive objects um, constrain gestures as they do with the TUI. And then changes in shape can inform the user of, the, of a change in state of the underlying digital representation. And so that would be more the epistemic function. So there's a way of knowing from the shape changing behavior of the object, something about the underlying um, re digital representation and how it's changing, which is the more important thing. So we're starting to get into the realm of dynamic information um, being reflected back through the haptic channel. Now, in the case of a completely virtual object, as here we have this uh, virtual chess game, you still have user gestures that are tracked and they can in fact shape the behavior of a virtual object. So there can be deformation. You can even have sort of dynamic behaviors like uh, deformable objects that can restore themselves. So it's squishy objects basically. Um, and you can map that energy uh, the gestural input that from the user manipulating this virtual object into the digital space and again use it um, to control some kind of parameters of the underlying um, representation. But the objects don't push back so there's no physical representation and they can't constrain user behavior in any way. So this is sometimes why it's hard to manipulate virtual objects because you don't, they don't have a physical presence that you can take advantage of in controlling some aspect of a, a digital representation. So now our arrow has intangible on one side and digital on the other. And you see the link between the two is completely broken now because the energy from the user is, is not reflected back to the user through the sense of touch. So Another category of objects which might get us into an inter interesting space are augmented objects. So these are physical objects that have some behavior in addition to just being tangible. Um, often they are reactive. This is, I mean, when you get into this terminology, the, the terms get very close to each other. And you could say that a shape changing object is essentially an augmented object of, of a particular kind and so on. But typically augmented objects um, overlay a behavior a digital behavior on some physical property of the object that's being manipulated. So here's pebble boxes, which is my old project, but it's interesting because it pushes on, a, on augmented objects in a very interesting way. So here you have pebbles that don't change their form, but what we're interested in here is something about their dynamic behavior. So in this case, we look at collisions in the case of pebbles, but you could look at other dynamic behaviors like friction uh, and so on. Um, and what happens here is that you can change the sonic behavior of the, um, you can change the behavior of the sound basically in response to what somebody is doing with a pebble. So pebbles can either just be pebbles, in which case every time you move a pebble and it collides with another pebble, that's what you hear. Or you can pull on that metaphor and have pebbles be, for instance, droplets of water or coins or something else. And what you're preserving is the sort of particulate nature of pebbles in the um, sound to which they're mapped. So all of the things that you can do with pebbles and collisions then become available as things that you can do with sounds. And so we typically use granular synthesis in this project to map things like uh, collision timing, collision uh, amplitude, centroid so if we have pebbles of different sizes the pitch of the collision slightly changes 
And then you can map those onto uh, behaviors of grains in a granular synthesis model. So some, now you can take, um, you can move your hand through pebbles and hear your hand through moving through water. So this is an interesting twist on augmented objects because it suggests that the relationship between, in this case, touch and sound could be more malleable than you might think. So it's not just tangible, it's that you can take some dynamic physical behavior of one set of objects and use it to control the dynamic behavior of sounds that are related to those objects through some aspect of their physics. And in this case, we have the situation where sometimes the tactile form is fixed and, and the auditory or visual form is, is changeable. Sometimes the properties of an object are fixed, as in the case of the pebbles, but the, the actual mapping is, is variable. Something about the dynamic mapping of the objects can change. Or in the case of a shape changing in, uh, interface, the form will change, but the surface properties may stay the same, for instance. And sometimes no properties are fixed. Um, and so in an active shape changing interface, it might also be able to change its texture. Um, and so there you have a, a very interesting space for thinking about the mapping between the physical and the digital. So just to kind of draw everything together then, let's return to Cato's model, model and see if it gets us anywhere. So the point here is that the similarity between interactions with objects in extended reality um, to that of DMIs, because they're both interactions which can be ergonomically complex and they're both temporally nuanced. So there's a lot of useful information, as I said, in the way that people are moving that could be used in, uh, picked up and used in extended reality to do more interesting things uh, in response to how people are manipulating objects. So the question then is, can this model teach us anything that we could bring into XOR? So my proposal is that is even as a thought experiment, it, this is useful because it, because it casts a spotlight on how energy is exchanged across an interactive boundary between a, a physical and a digital, physical object and an underlying digital representation. And it implies that within this energetic exchange, whether it's actually mechanically coupled or even mapped, there can be information relayed back to the user through the haptic system or haptic channel that could inform them about the change in state of the underlying uh, digital representation. And that kind of extends to some ideas in embodied cognition where we think about how bodily interaction with the environment is shaped by the response to somebody's actions that they can perceive from the environment. So if somebody is attuned to certain changes in the environment in response to their action, they can track those changes and those changes can in turn guide what they do next. So I like this, and this is kind of what set me off on this, is this idea of Alan Kay's that doing with symbols makes meaning. And I'm kind of thinking, or doing with images, doing with images makes symbols, but I kind of like to push this around to say that um, doing with movement makes meaning, doing through movement makes meaning rather. And so I think that if we can sort of take away the fact that, um, you know, in, in certain tangible and extended reality contexts, it might be worth thinking less about the, the form of an object and how that relates to an underlying di uh, digital representation and more about the dynamic gesture space that's created through ma manipulating an object and seeing how that can be can both um, shape the behavior of the underlying digital representation, but also be used in reflecting back to the user through the haptic channel, something about the way the information itself is, is changing and, and um, can be informative for the user. And so my point here is that when you involve the sense of touch, whether it's actively or passively um, used, either actively tracked or just passively uh, present and, and whether the system is reactive or not, you automatically involve this extra channel that through which meaning can be exchanged. 
And the point is we just have to sort of learn how to capture this meaning from the data we're already collecting and then use it in the way we design interactive uh, systems that have objects that are or are not instrumented. So oh, that's my thoughts. Great. Thanks very much, Sheila. Uh, we have a bit of time for questions. Um, I can jump in here, but uh, I'd want to offer it out first. Um, so if you have a question, you can either post in the chat um, or you can you feel free to turn your microphone on or camera on and ask it directly as you prefer. Uh, if you're going to do the latter, perhaps put your hand up first. So I'm going to jump in as a sort of chair's privilege. Um, yeah, the, the, that, that phrase is really kind of potent. Um, doing through movement makes meaning. I wondered if you have any, um, I mean, the pebble box feels like it, it, it's quite an evocative example of that. Do you have any other go-to examples of things that you think sort of showcase that quite nicely? Well, I'm thinking about, about it a lot in terms of the braille display that work that we're doing. So we're developing a full page tactile array that has both touch sensing and dynamic tactile output. And so kind of what it's forcing me to do is to rethink interaction. Uh, so I should backtrack and say, for visually impaired people, this moment of being able to have a whole page of information that's refreshable is a bit like the transition from the command line to the GUI for sighted computer users. And so it involves us having to rethink what how you might control information, how you might shape what you're doing, what the kind of hand gestures should be, how the system should react in response to what you're doing. So things like panning and zooming are the most obvious examples, but you can actually push on things and have them change under the hand. Uh, but then because you're using a single, um, uh, because you're using a single channel of, of sort of um, exchange, does it make sense for the information to deform under the hand or is that actually quite confusing? So all of these things are making me think about this sort of role of movement in interaction design in, in a much deeper way. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, seeing um, you present on the Braille interface um, in the TED talk, I think it was, you talk about a particular interface that was developed that produced static bumps for braille in a kind of mouse-like format which didn't work because the you couldn't kind of move across the braille and so there's a gesture even in reading that was what i took from that yeah that's a that's a very interesting way of putting it in fact <laughs> we got so tired of people saying well why don't you just do one you know cell you only need one cell that we actually did this whole study where we compared being able to move the hand with a single cell, the single cell refreshing under the finger, being able to move your fingers across a, a display like you normally would, and then having the display slide between your fingers. And um, we kind of wanted to do this kind of myth busting thing. And again, uh, eventually what we showed was, and it's not surprising if you know how touch works, is that the lateral motion between the skin and the surface is what actually keeps your tactile sense alert to what's going on and sliding your fingers over the surface of Braille is how you actually get the sort of uh, rising edge information about the changing dot patterns in Braille. So yes, you're right. The gestures that you need to perform in order to pick up information through the tactile channel are quite specific. And the reason why the, the um, mouse didn't work was because the dots would refresh in place. You can move your hand so you could get some kind of proprioceptive feedback, which was better than just a static display refreshing under your finger, but you couldn't couldn't get any information from the sliding contact between the finger and the braille. So, uh, and that could be very different for a different application, obviously, but for braille, at least, we know that you need a sliding contact between the finger and the surface, and that that's very hard to do if you just have a single cell. So just a question in the comment there from uh, Leon Liu. Yep. Could you read it out to me? I yeah, guess so that I go. Leon says, thank you so much, Sheila. I'm curious if you have thoughts on what types of information do you foresee being conveyed through the haptic channel? I've wondered about the intelligibility or granularity of information through haptics. Yeah, so I kind of go back to, I, I'm going to sort of throw in a name here. Um, 
uh, Lambros Malafaris did a whole bunch of work on sort of how we shape our world and our, our world in turn shapes what, what we do. And he has this lovely example of, of, of a potter's wheel. So when you, you when you shape clay on a wheel, the way that the clay responds to what you're doing is also informative about what you do next. And I think that's a nice metaphor to think about how we could use haptic information, especially if we have a sort of shape changing interface. So, you know, if you're shaping something in an environment, it could be, I don't know, that you're kneading dough in a virtual kitchen or something, <laughs> that the way the dough might behave could, you know, you could train somebody to look for like, um, you know, the formation of gluten strands, if you could control the texture of the, the malleable material that you were using on the outside. So you, you, there's sort of all of that meaningful information can be in the physical interaction between an object and an environment. And you could imagine stretching that metaphor literally in, <laughs> in some way within a virtual environment where the context actually kind of tends to dictate the information that could be useful, usefully fed back, I suppose, to somebody. Does that kind of make sense, Luan? Thank you so much. So I wonder if I can use co-chair's privilege to um, ask a question. So um, uh, Sheila, I was very interested in what you're saying about the necessity in many cases of lateral movement of the skin yeah. moving over objects. I wondered if, um, if Jeff Hawkins' um, A Thousand Brains theory happened to be on your radar. Nope. Okay, so the the reason I'm saying that is we had a we had a project at the Open University where we have um, physical designers um, yeah. doing courses, um, uh, doing collaborative courses, some of whom are blind, yeah. um, and they need to exchange things they have designed with other people. And we were working with um, haptic VR devices, um, but we really needed a theoretical grounding for this. And we were absolutely amazed by the stuff that Jeff Hawkins was oh. saying in his Thousand Brains theory. It was, it's the most understandable version mm. of predictive processing that I've seen. Huh. It talks specifically about things you could learn from moving your fingers over objects and what that could tell you and what the brain mechanisms might be. So oh, I must I must look that up. I know that we try to um so a number of years ago, um Transactions on Haptics asked four of us who are visually impaired researching in the area of haptics to come up with a sort of an introduction to a, a, an issue on various sort of applications of haptics for accessible technologies. And one of the things um, I tried to do in that paper was to use sort of Klatsky and Lederman's uh, exploratory procedures theory, if anybody's familiar with that, that sort of there are canonical ways in which people interact with objects if you ask them to extract certain properties. So if you ask somebody about texture, they'll rub their finger. If you ask them about shape, they'll move, you know, they'll move their hands or their fingers around to get a sense of the whole form of an object. And I tried to divide different, or, or rather we tried to divide different technologies like force feedback, fiber tactile feedback, tactile displays and so on. And to sort of break them down by the kinds of exploratory procedures they supported as a way of sort of helping people to determine what kind of information was available um, to somebody using these devices uh, uh, so that then you could sort of look at like, okay, I want to create a map uh, that can be explored with two hands. Well, then, you know, a force feedback device isn't much use because you can only feel the word from the end of a pencil effectively. So it was a sort of an, uh, an effort to, to do, I think, something much more simple, I guess, than, than you're suggesting, but probably a little bit more applied as well. Maybe we've got time to fit one in from Konstantinos Vasilakos. Okay. Who, do you want to read your own question there? Or perhaps we should read it. I'll, I'll just read it quickly, Yeah. just in case. Uh, so the question is, uh, I'm curious if there is a way to theorize mapping strategies and thus, if we could develop uh, a model for assessment of mapping of DMIs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the challenge that everybody's been kind of working with. And there's definitely work that builds on Kato's kind of instrumental gesture idea. Uh, there's some work by Go Wang and a student of his at the moment that's kind of interesting. So there's a whole theory, a whole body of work in design, which I'm sure some people are 
are sort of familiar with, which is this idea of movement first design. This kind of comes from a Danish school. Um, uh, uh, I'm thinking of Kloster and others um, sort of in the early 2000s, but that you can actually, instead of doing sort of form follows function, you can actually do a sort of form follows movement approach. Um, and then that's kind of been taken into the music uh, uh, DMI domain now, and people are sort of looking at movement patterns and then sort of saying, well, okay, if this is how you want to move to control this sound, what, what is the form that the, that the instrument should take? So I think it's less a sort of, it's a, rather than a theory, it's more of a, a methodology, I think. And maybe in time, a theoretical approach will emerge, but it is a kind of an interesting way to approach, I think, design. Great. Thanks so much, Sheila. We should probably switch over to Nick at this point, um, but that was really interesting. Yeah, and we can we can pick some of this up m more in the discussion at the end, perhaps. Mm, thank you very much. Um, oh, just one very quick question, maybe we can fit in. Emily Graber yeah. asks, could you repeat the name of the Form Follows Movement author? Um, I can send it to you. Her last name is Kluster, and now you're going to ask me how to spell it, and I can't. <laughs> I think it's K L. I'll, I'll send it on, um, and I'll send on one paper that you can share, and then once yeah. you've got that paper, you can follow the trail. Okay. Uh, great. I'll, I'll pass it to, to you at this point then. Thanks.